Labour never expected to win in the Cheshire and Amersham by-election. However, the scale of their defeat has raised questions about the health of the party under Starmer's leadership. They won only 622 votes, which represents a 1.6% vote share. This was Labour's worst ever performance in the constituency. So you can see here, they've never done particularly well in the constituency and they have done very badly. Their previous low was 6% in 2010, their previous high 21% in 2017. Historically, it looks very bad. However, speaking to Sky this morning, Jess Phillips suggested Labour's poor result needn't worry the party as this time it was the result of tactical voting. Why do you think that you didn't do better in the Chesham and Amersham by-election? I mean, I don't think that anyone was necessarily expecting the result we got, but I think even fewer people would have been expecting uh, the Labour Party to uh, to, to take uh, Cheshire and Amersham. And I think that what's happened there is that voters aren't stupid. Um, often, I think, it, it, in public commentary, we, we, we talk about voters uh, in a manner as if they don't know what they're doing. And it seems very clear that the vote in Cheshire and Amersham was a vote against the government and the voters uh, decided that the best way to do that was to, to corral around the most likely winner and in this case it was the Lib Dems. It's a classic Lib Dem squeeze message. I, I beat the Lib Dems so I, I'm no stranger to it. Jess Phillips says some unreasonable things. That probably wasn't one of them. People are more likely to vote tactically in by-elections. That's because as we talked about you get to hit the government cost-free, risk-free. Also in a by-election you normally have the, the opposition parties campaigning a bit harder than they normally would in a general election. So we know that the Lib Dems were campaigning incredibly heavily in this constituency. Also, I want to show you one more graphic because we compared this vote to Labour's pre previous um, performance in that constituency. It's probably also just as good a comparison, potentially a better comparison, to look at Richmond Park in 2016. Then you can see, likewise, the Labour vote really fell as people realised it was a, a two-horse. Christian Woolman was the Labour candidate. He only got 1,515 votes, um, which was 3.6% of the vote, down 87 from previous. So again, we see that the Labour Party was squeezed, though it was to less of a significant degree than it was this time around. Owen Jones, what's your take here? Do you think that Jess Phillips is right that essentially this was just the result of tactical voting? Or do you think the fact it was so low that it only 622 people voted for the Labour Party suggests that there is also something else going on here? I think it's a bit from column A, a bit from column B, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, that is Labour never going to obviously be competitive in that seat in 2017, which of course the high high mark, watermark of Corbynism. Uh, Labour came second, but a distant second. This is true blue country, and realistically, only the Liberal Democrats have a good chance in a in a constituency which is as safe a seat for the Conservatives as that particular one in the South, with that kind of social composition. Clearly, vast numbers of people who would prefer to vote for Labour if they had that choice voted for the Liberal Democrats because they knew that was the best possible way of getting rid of a Conservative member of Parliament. But equally, the brutal reality is that there is no motivating reason for anyone to vote for the Labour Party in 2020, the year of our law 2021. Nothing. No reason at all. I don't know why people... I, don't, look, I vote Labour because, to the irritation sometimes of people on the left... You know, I'm a Labourite of 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 a, of a left persuasion. So I loyally go and vote for that. I don't know why other people are voting for the Labour Party at the moment. I don't know how you answer the question. I really want to vote for the Labour Party because to stop the Tories, fine. But as we've seen in this particular case, people just concluded there was a different way of of stopping that. People aren't voting for something. They're not. You don't vote for the Labour Party at the moment because you think here's a great inspiring vision that resonates with me, which will transform the life of me, my family, my community, my country, uh, or indeed the world if we look at the climate emergency. Of course no one's doing that. So, I mean, the fact that the Labour vote is essentially the same as the Labour membership in that, and I, I presume some Labour members vote for the Liberal Democrats, so it's not exactly a, a, an exact um, Venn di diagram there. Um, the, the, the fact is, you know, the, the Labour Party's got the sort of vote you'd expect from the monster raving loony party, um, which is humiliating. You, you know, there's been many by-elections in the past where people have tactically voted for the Liberal Democrats, but the Labour Party still retain a core vote. No Labour core vote existed 
at all in the sea. It just vanished. It evaporated. And, and I think that's the problem that sums up for the Labour Party. Normally, a political party, a main, one of the two major parties, in any, any significant constituency when it's, been, when it's had a significant vote in the past, should have a diehard, I'm going to vote for my party to the bitter end. I don't care what the stakes are. And that didn't exist in this constituency because there's nothing to drive people to vote for the Labour Party. But I do think it was overwhelmingly... Uh, tactical voting. What should worry the Labour Party is their excuse about a so-called vaccine uh, bounce for the government, meaning that they lost the last by-election in Hartlepool and have a very good chance of losing the next by-election in Batley and Spen is because of vaccine rollout. Well, if that's true, why is it hitting them and not the Liberal Democrats? The problem isn't so much Labour's vote share in this by-election. It's what it says about Keir Starmer's excuses about their vote share in by-elections, which they should have won. So in Hartlepool, obviously, Labour didn't lose because of tactical voting, because it was a two-horse race between Labour and the Conservatives. When Labour did lose, what were Keir Starmer's allies saying? They were saying, well, Boris Johnson um, is now essentially indestructible because we're amid a, a vaccine bounce. How could anyone, however good our leader was, possibly beat this man who has just delivered vaccines to the masses, right? And as you say, Owen, that argument doesn't stack up because why was Ed Davey able to do it, right? <laughs> People in this constituency also got vaccinated. But so, and, and actually more of them have been vaccinated now than they had been vaccinated when Hartlepool was, was coming along. So, so Keir Starmer really is going to struggle to find excuses for elections which do matter to the Labour Party when they lose them. Obviously, Hartlepool was won. Batley and Spen is coming up and we will see what happens then. Whatever we think about what this says about Keir Starmer, it does seem that there is some disquiet within the Labour Party, including in Keir Starmer's top team. Kate Ferguson from The Sun today tweeted, Knives out for Keir after the Chesham and Amersham by-election disaster, hearing that supporters of Angela Rayner and Lisa Nandy quietly ringing round to sound out possible support if he goes. That claim has been disputed. Rachel Wim of at the Huffington Post tweeted later, Labour source close to Angela Rayner and Lisa Nandy has called reports the two have been sounding out MPs about a leadership challenge. Absolute bollocks. Um, so claims and counterclaims there. What we do know, um, which I saw Owen Jones tweeting about before this show, is that Ben Nunn, who is Keir Starmer's Director of Communications, has resigned. So there definitely is disquiet at the top of the team. It's not just a case of briefing and counter-briefing. Something is going on. Owen, can you enlighten us any more about what, what is happening at the top of the Labour Party right now? Well, the wheels are falling off. Um, what, I mean, I'll just be blunt about it. That's, that's very self-evident. It's been quite an open secret that the Ben Nunn, the director, previous, no longer the director of communication, has not been happy in that, in that, in that role for a long time. I think various people who 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 have a good grip of Labour politics, uh, who who aren't necessarily on the left, there was a consensus that they don't have a political strategy of any direction. They came into the position they have, thinking that by virtue of looking competent, uh, Keir Starmer not having any baggage, being a knight of the realm, no less, having run a state bureaucracy, uh, he could present himself as competent compared to his predecessor and competent in contrast to Boris Johnson. That was incinerated, that dividing line, uh, by the vaccine rollout because they didn't offer a dividing line based on vision or values. Uh, they were left with, with literally absolutely nothing to say, which is not a great position for directive communications to be uh, to be left in. I think what we're talking about in terms of the manoeuvrings, though, I think is important because I know sources close to Angela Rayner's team are very adamant that they're not telephoning people around. But I also know other people who are very adamant that people linked to Angela Rayner are ringing people. So, you know, there, there, was, a confl there, was, there was a conflict in, uh, in, in, in understanding of what's happening in that particular case. You know, I think the issue with Angela Rayner is there are people close to Angela Rayner who do want her to stand for leader. And that I think there are others who don't at the moment. And I think the, the the worry is that old adage, the cliche, he who wields the dagger never wears the crown. If you overthrow your leader, you generally do not, or you never, and there's not really a, a, a direct 
uh, you know, a precedent for, 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 for then replacing them. I mean, take example, Michael Heseltine. Michael Heseltine mobilized in an attempt to overthrow Margaret Thatcher in the coup. He didn't end up her replacement. John Major, who was her Chancellor of the Exchequer and loyal to Margaret Thatcher um, in that episode, he instead became the successor. So, it, you know, there's no easy route. I think the other issue I'd say is a big chunk of the right of the Labour Party, I, I think there's good reason to believe, are waiting to see what the result of the Unite General Secretary election is. Because the Uni Unite is the most influential trade union in the country, the most influential union within the Labour Party. And if Gerard Coyne, the right-wing candidate, wins, that will then be used to clamp down on democracy within the Labour Party and do all sorts of very, very, very terrifying bad things, but also to rewrite the leadership rules, probably a reversion to the Electoral College, for example. So you give a massive chunk of the votes weighted in favour of members of parliament. You change the nominations required to get a left winger on the ballot in the first place, um, and that would stop a left winger getting on the ballot paper. Um, the issue, I think, with Keir Starmer now is dead man walking, politically speaking. Um, you can't lose two by-elections and stay on as leader in, in the long term. I mean, it's he if he loses Batley and Sped, where I was earlier this week, we have to call for him to resign, no ifs, no buts. It's a ludicrous position to be in. But oppositions do not lose by-elections. That almost never happens. Before Hartlepool, that had happened twice in the last 50 years. You can't double the number of by-elections you have lost or an opposition has lost to the government in the last half century within the space of two months and credibly argue you have any chance whatsoever of staying in power. I went to Batley and Spen and what I saw were particularly Muslim Labour voters who are core Labour voters, very important point to make, by the way, because there's going to be a whole load of Islamophobic dog whistles, there already are, coming out of Batley and Spen, somehow suggesting that Muslim voters aren't legitimate voters, that this is a George Galloway factor, rah, 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 rah. In the last general election, an estimated, according to the latest poll, 86% of British Muslims voted for the Labour Party in this country. There's over 3 million Muslims in this country. In many seats, British Muslims have a big, big influence over which party becomes or wins that each each constituency and they are furious furious when you talk to them they feel completely abandoned by their party they want to teach labor a lesson they want to give labor a punch in the nose that's how the people i spoke to they sounded just like scottish labor voters before them who spoke in just the same way my father my mother my grandmother my grandfather Ever since our family first arrived here, we always voted for the Labour Party. For the first time, I'm not going to vote for the Labour Party, and I'm going to teach them a lesson. And I heard that from Scottish Labour voters. Uh, it was the same said by some voters in the so-called Red Wall as well. And the issue is, in Scotland, when they crossed that electoral Rubicon, they didn't come back. Now, in Batley and Spen, George Galloway, who I think is a cynical opportunist, uh, to say the least, just very conservative a few weeks ago, uh, but nonetheless... He has cut through with his messages on things like Palestine. And, you know, when pundits say, oh, Palestine and, you know, for, these are foreign policy niche issues that the average voter doesn't care about, apart from freaks and the Labour Party and all the rest of it. Well, they're wrong because you, everyone was talking about Palestine on the doorstep or a lot of people um, in Batley and Spen. Uh, the reason that so many British Muslims were more attracted to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party was his track record on fighting Islamophobia um, his stance on issues like uh, Palestine, but also Kashmir, for example, uh, and also the fact that around half of Muslims in this country live below the poverty line and Labour's domestic policies are more likely to resonate with them as a consequence. Um, and, that, that, you know, this idea that Keir Starmer's leadership had, you know, this is what Peter Mandelson said about working class voters, allegedly. They have nowhere else to go. They thought 2019 voters, whether they be Muslim, whether they be young voters, that's just, that's the floor. They're not going to leave Labour Party. They're not going to, you know, we, we don't need to listen to them anymore. We just have to go and go and chase these other voters and wave flags in a very patronising way in order to do so uh, without committing to a vision of what we're going to do with the country. And guess what? It's not one of any of those voters on over, but it is losing the support of those voters uh, instead. So I think what's happening is Labour's electoral coalition is further collapsing under Keir Starmer's leadership. Uh, as things stand, things are looking very bad in Batley and Spenner for Labour. And privately, Labour councillors tell me that the seat is lost. They tell me on, on streets where 80 to 90 percent of local residents 
voted Labour in the last election. They're just telling canvassers to F off. Um, bitter opposition. Actually, the Labour candidate, uh, you know, Joe Cox's sister, is actually very charismatic on the doorstep. She's obviously a very good campaigner. You know, there's no political vision being offered by the Labour Party. That's the issue, and it's that's cutting through. So I think what will happen after Batley and Spen is we on the left have to, if he loses Batley and Spen, Keir Starmer has to resign as leader of the Labour Party, and the left has to think very seriously about how we get some sort of candidate on the ballot paper in those circumstances. If people have left the Labour Party over the last few months, I would strongly recommend you join so that you will have a vote in any coming contest. Uh, it does underline how important the Unite General Secretary election is. That's why Steve Turner has to win. So for those of you who are angry that Howard Beckett's not in anymore after he withdrew to support Steve Turner, that is a politically very, very important um, uh, battlefield in terms of for the left in British society and within the Labour Party. Uh, but I think the right may hold their fire, or a lot of the parliamentary Labour Party, because they fear at the moment, until the leadership rules are changed, the left has a chance of clawing back some power, either with a candidate who's more amenable to the left or an outright left candidate. So I think they will hold fire, a lot of them. But his position will be untenable if he loses the battle in spend by election. He won't lead... Labour into the next general election, in my view, if that happens. The issue is, will it happen a leadership contest when they rigged the rules to stop the left getting on? And that's a big, big problem for us. Mm -hmm.